Congress has a record of huddling up amongst the parties and getting behind their party leaders like Mr. Boehner and previously uh, Pelosi when she was speaker. Occasionally issues come up that are, supposed, that are supported by party leadership, uh, but not by conservative constituents, um, or, or the majority of the American people for that matter, um, or those living in a congressional district in this case. How would you handle pressure from party leadership, and what would be your avenue to, because uh, I'm assuming uh, you may resist party leadership, uh, based on our conversation tonight, but how, how would you handle that politically? I mean, how, how would you resist party leadership? Very simple. As I told you, I have two criteria to vote for anything. If it's not constitutional, if it doesn't enhance freedom and liberties and would threaten the future of my reasons for running and the reasons why you would want me to be there, because you love your grandchildren as much as I love mine, there is no pressure that they could bring upon me that would make me give in on that. So you would just because articulate that message? That would I be would articulate message. that. That's the first thing I would do. Because you know what, folks? If I was to give in, you know what I've just done? I have just sold my grandchildren's future down the river. How many of y'all are here grandparents? A lot of you. I can tell by the, the gray hair. Yeah. For the camera, that was yeah. about 95% yeah. of the room. <laughs> do you not? I'm going to say something, and I bet you if I ask how many of you that feel the same way, I'm going to get the same number of hands go up. My grandchildren's future are not for sale to anybody at any time for any price, period. How many agree? And so that's the first thing. That's what I articulate. Second thing is I come back here. I get on every talk radio show. I write to the newspapers. And I, let, I come to these meetings. I through the web and everything else and tell people, hey, this is the type of pressure I'm getting. They're wanting me to cave in on this. This is not constitutional. This is not what you sent me to Washington for. And I'm not going to give in because that's not what you want me to do. I let everybody know what's going on. Because, folks, I will tell you this. People say, well, what are you going to do for the district? If you come back and you have this type of attitude, you're not going to get anything passed. Then what? I will come back and I will tell you I stood my ground, I upheld my oath to the Constitution, and I stood for freedom and liberty in the Constitution. I did what you expected me to do. I fulfilled my responsibility as a representative. And if nothing else comes out of that, I will have fulfilled my primary responsibility to you as a citizen of this country. Uh, Congress is notorious for passing complicated legislation with bills exceeding 1,000 to 2,000 pages. Um, would you support legislation that would restrict Congress to only passing single-issue bills? Absolutely. Positively. Listen, if you go to, uh, I guess it's on my, our Facebook page, and you might have to dig back several you know, months in the archives. I wrote an article on, our essay on James Madison's view of legislation. I've written longer essays than what's there. But Madison made the point that legislation should be simple, written plainly so that the citizens of the country, the average citizens, could read it and understand it. I have read before it passed, and I wasn't representative, about 80% of Obamacare. Anybody else read any of that mess? Was that not the biggest uh, pile of gobbledygook you've ever read? I only had to read 28 pages and I knew we are in trouble. Because about 28 pages where it said all existing um, plans are grandfathered until they make one single change. And what happens at every open enrollment? Deductibles are changed, co-pays are changed, whatever. And I said, we're in trouble. Because of some of my other certifications, I had seven certifications. One of my other ones, I was a certified employee benefit specialist from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And so I thought, we are in trouble. And so they need to be single issued. They need to be written in simple language so that everybody can understand. Instead of loading these things, that's how we, that's how we got this stupid thing with the NDAA. McCain and Levin slipped that thing in there about detention. You've got to quit because then you will not put people in the position of, well, yeah, that's really important and that's needed, but that's not constitutional. And then this idea of what do you do? You know, do you give in and compromise? And again, what did Ayn Rand say about compromise? It is always evil that, tri that triumphs. It is always evil that benefits. So we've got to get back to a single issue thing. Make it simple. Put it in English that we can all agree, not legalese. I just want to let everybody know that uh, we only have a few questions left, so thanks for coming and being patient. I know it's a little stuffy in here. And uh, yes, my Bell, parents, and you got Bell. a lot of people. 
And you got me up here with a lot of hot, hot air beans. Yeah, a lot of hot yeah. my, my wife is standing herself like crazy. <laughs> so uh, do you support the Federal Reserve System or any of the duties in its charter? It has two primary responsibilities that's been given by Congress. Please explain why or why not. Anybody here believe the Federal Reserve is part of the federal government? No. A lot of good. Because you studied the issue. Most people think the Federal Reserve, because it says federal in it, and that was the reason why they named it that, is part of the government. It's not. It's a private bank. We have a private bank controlling our monetary system. And no, I am not in favor of the Fed. Because since its inception, we've gone through continuous cycles of boom and bust because of their monetary policy. And just to clarify it, uh, in, in its, in its uh, obligation to regulate the money supply uh, and also um, you know, reduce unemployment you know, and, and the economic objectives it's, it's supposed yeah. to uh, regulate. So yeah. well, you're saying either one of those is... Neither one of those is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. And how is it done in its job? Why did we have the Great Depression and the crash? It was exacerbated by the Federal Reserve and prolonged by the New Deal policies of FDR. And so, no, I'm not in favor of the Fed. I believe we need to go back to pre-1913 days. And what does the Constitution say? Because let's get back to the Constitution, the enumerated powers. Only Congress can do what? Coin money. Coin money. We've all heard the phrase, not worth a continental. You all know why that, where that phrase came from, don't you? Because the Continental Congress printed paper money to pay the conscripts of the uh, war of the Continental Army, and after the war, those things tanked, and speculators came in and bought it and ruined the lives of a lot of those who fought and shed blood for our independence. Not worth the Continental. The founders were appalled at the prospect of paper money. It's got to be back by now. We want to have paper money, that's fine. But two things got to happen. One, the banks that are issuing it, and if you, let me give you a good book to read. Ludwig von Mises' Theory of Money and Credit. The first couple hundred pages are just, you know, economics. Yeah, I mean, it's... That's a long... Yeah, book. yeah, you got to slip. But if you read the addendum, that was, it was written in about 1912, if I remember right. But 1953-54, he added an addendum. A progress towards a sound monetary theory. He laid out how we can get the United States back to a sound monetary theory. And the first thing he said was, quit printing the money. That was step number one. But the thing that he said has to happen is this. Stop printing the money. Get back to a true classical gold standard. And third, banks that issue money should not be allowed to have fractional banking. That is, you only have a portion of gold to back the enormous amount of bills that you put out. You want to put out a million dollars in circulation of money, you better have a million dollars worth of gold to back it up. So you'd probably, I mean, what, would you favor auditing the Federal Reserve as maybe a first step to oh, absolutely. publicize it? Absolutely. Maybe it's got to be audited because they're the ones that are pulling the strings in our monetary system, so they need to be made accountable. Yeah. Switching gears, uh, we talked a little bit about the EPA and reg regulating the energy industry. Um, do you think, or private property in general, but do you think that the federal government has any role to play in assigning an agency to protect the environment? Uh, and where in the Constitution is this type of authority enumerated? The only role that I can conceive of a national EPA is a role in which there would be a dispute between the states over some type of pollution. For instance, some company in Iowa builds a plant on the banks of the Mississippi River. And they dump a bunch of crud in the Mississippi River, and it flows down and affects Illinois, Missouri, and on down. And Missouri and Illinois have stricter controls over their water pollution. And they get, they're getting mad at Iowa, and there's a, there's a problem. The federal government's role in the Constitution is to promote, promote harmony and commerce amongst the states. They become the arbitrator, if you will, in disputes like that. That is the only conceivable role I can think of constitutionally for an agency like the EPA. And I can tell you this, that does happen, that type of pollution, because as a boy, I grew up in the St. Louis area, two blocks away from the Bluff of Missouri River. And I can remember as a boy going down to the riverbank and we'd throw rocks and stones in it and see huge islands of foam floating down the middle of the river. 
And you, believe me, you didn't dare want to eat any fish that anybody caught in that thing because it was nasty. And so that is the case. That came downstream somewhere. That's the only role I can think of. Other than that, let the states, let the local people, because they're the ones that are affected. Let them determine and bring the pressure on their local officials because it is the local officials that are the closest to us. Our state representatives, and I saw Bill Zender walk in a minute ago. I don't know if he walked. Yeah. You know, they're closer to us because Austin is closer than Washington. Therefore, things about this issue belong at a more localized state or county level, not some 1,500 miles So maybe away. there, because my other question was, what alternative would you propose to be Maybe like some sort of, the federal court system would handle that then, between the, to mediate? Well, maybe not between the, court, the states. Maybe not the court system per se, although the Constitution does authorize maybe some the sort court. of congressional committee to. Well, not necessarily congressional committee. Maybe uh, that's where, the, as I said, where the EPA could have a role. They're the arbitrator board of disputes between states over pollution. So they wouldn't pass regulations. They would no, just they mediate. Would not. They're a mediator of, a, Period. of an isolated incident. Right. Someone brings cause. Right. To, to try to keep, petition them for a resolution. Exactly. exactly. To keep it from going to court. Um, so uh, we only got a couple questions left. I was going to say, the United States is a constitutional republic. Can you please explain the difference between our system and that of a democracy? Democracy is based, okay. I spoke at my grandkids' uh, school. They go to Park Row Christian Academy on Constitution Day last September. And I spoke to the third and fourth graders and the fifth and sixth graders. And here's how I explain that to them. And if you have children and you want to explain it to them, I think they, these kids got it. So let me give you this example. You're welcome to use it. Just make sure you give me credit. <laughs> I was talking to the whole room. And I told them, I said, okay. School is going to make a rule that only Coke or Pepsi will be served in the lunchroom. Of course, we know government doesn't want us to have sodas in the lunchroom. But never mind the federal government. This is private school. They do what they want. Kind of. Kind of. I said, now, you're going to get to vote. Pepsi or Coke? So I said, okay. I wrote Pepsi, Coke, and boy, I said, how many here want Coke? A few of them raised their hands, which surprised me. I said, now, how many want Pepsi? And boy, the majority of the hands went, I thought, woo, I thought this was Coke territory. I said, okay, everybody, the only drink you're going to have in the lunchroom is Coke. I mean, is Pepsi. And some of the Coke kids, oh, man. I said, now, kids, what we've just done is democracy. Majority rules. You get enough kids that you convince enough other kids to vote for Coke instead of Pepsi, you'll have Coke. Because majority always, you, that's democracy. And democracy always leads to anarchy. A republic is something different. And I told him, I said, okay, now, and they divided them into three groups. I said, each one of you groups, I want you to select one person to come up here and stand with me. And they all guys, okay, you go. No, you go. You need. And I said, come on, guys, come on. I need one representative. I want any one person for each one of your groups. And they finally picked, picked one. And they came up and I said, okay, these three are now your representatives. You now have no more say-so in what type of a soda you're going to have in the lunchroom. So I turned to him and said, what do you want, Coke or Pepsi? He said, Coke. Kids that want a Coke smile. <laughs> Look at the next one says, Coke or Pepsi? Pepsi. All the Pepsi guys, kids smiled. I looked at the third kid and I said, okay, it's on you. You break the tie, what do you want? He looked at me and, um, Pepsi. I said, okay, it's Pepsi. And the Coke kids went, oh man. And I said, now kids, what we've just done is a democratic republic. You democratically, by majority in each one of your groups, chose one person to be your representative. And they came up here and they voted for you. I said, that is a republic. And if you folks that want a Coke don't like it, next time when you choose a representative, choose somebody that likes Coke. <laughs> and you know what, folks? Those third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade kids, when I put them on that level, they got it. They understood what democracy and what a republic is. And they told my wife later, even a couple days later, that they understood it and they talked about it. That is a simple example. And I share that with you from this standpoint because we've got to teach our children what the difference is. Because we've got too many that are not exactly children anymore that don't understand that difference. And I think that puts it down to a very simple level where they can get it and understand it. We've reached our last question here. Uh, I was going to ask that this is... No, no we'll applause. Then, <laughs> well, I think everyone's just intently listening. So, 
If elected to office as a sitting congressman, would you publicly support a candidate challenging a Republican incumbent in the primary who shares your values? Which one shares my values, the challenger or the incumbent? Uh, I'm sorry. Would you publicly support a candidate who shares your values, who's challenging a Republican incumbent in the primary? So that the challenger, the challenger the should not use and the incumbent does not. Correct. You betcha. Yeah. Because we need everyone that thinks. And folks, I'm not. I'm like you. We are all. You know, we're we're the choir. We need more people that think like us. I never in my life thought I'd step up and do something like this. Never. But I finally reached my pop bang moment. That's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. And I decided I'm going to step up. And we need more people who will step up like that. And therefore, if you put me in the House of Representatives, I want as many more that think like we do there with me so that we can have a force to be reckoned with and we can take our country back and put it where it needs to be. Well, that ends the questions I have. Everyone give Mr. Kuchar a round of applause. slogan that we have. My original campaign slogan was to return to constitutionality, but my committee said, you know what, that works real good at the Tea Party because they're educated about the Constitution. The regular person doesn't, so they came up with the idea, you're not the same old Joe. And so I think you'll see. That's pretty catchy. I'm not the same old Joe.